No, I didn't suppose so. Well, good evening. Um, tonight, uh, we're delighted that uh, Russell Hoban has agreed to come in and talk <coughs> to yourself and to you all about his writing. Uh, Russell has been called the most original novelist we have in the Times, the strangest writer in Britain in the Independent, <laughs> and he's often referred to as having a cult following. And uh, maybe any writer that dares to bring in such f soaring flights of imagination into sort of very equally intimate human sto side storytelling is uh, destined to receive such intimations as somehow outside the mainstream. But I'm sure many of you are adamant that he is a most wonderful, accessible, riveting writer, a pleasure to read, and a necessity to introduce to others. Russell was born in near Pennsylvania in 1925. He was, uh, began writing at an early age, stories, poems during his school years. He then went uh, in 1943 to 45 to serve in the US Army in Italy. After that, he, he worked in advertising and illustration, a, a fairly su a substantial career as, as an illustrator, uh, before starting to write children's books in 1958. And since then, he's published more than 50 titles. Uh, in 1968, before moving permanently to London, he published his first full-length uh, novel, The Mouse and His Child, widely regarded as a, a children's classic, later made into an animated film featuring the voices of Peter Ustinov and Cloris Leachman. Uh, his first adult novel, The Lion of Boaz Jachin and Jachin Boaz, was published in 1973, and many more followed. Ridley Walker, published in 1980, was his biggest publishing success, making the bestseller list in the US and garnering many awards. In 1985, Turtle Diary was adapted by Harold Pinter into a film featuring Ben Kingsley and Glenda Jackson. And the last decade has seen uh, Russell publish almost a book every year. Uh, including the recent novel, Angelica Lost and Found, which you can find outside uh, at the bookstore for signing afterwards. Um, all continue to receive fine reviews and an enthusiastic readership. Ridley Walker keeps astounding everyone who encounters it. Peter Carey wrote, it's a work of genius, an entire inver invented history and lexicon, one of the masterworks of the past 40 years. Harold Bloom included Ridley Walker in his survey of literature, the Western Canon, and Anthony Burgess claimed that this is what literature is meant to be. This novel is one reason, an important reason, why we invited Russell here to speak this evening. Its vision of a possible future English takes the story of the English language as documented over in the main exhibition in the British Library, Evolving English, One Language, Many Voices. We, we treat the story up to the present day, across a thousand years. Russell takes it into a far, far, far possible future. Will Self, his novels have probably also been called original, strange, and probably cult as well. Uh, his love of and bravery with language and his willingness to embrace the barely possible in his novels made him an ideal choice to write an introduction to the 2002 edition of Ridley Walker. And we're delighted that he's been able to join us tonight to re-engage with this stunning book and talk to Russell about his wider writing career. Thank you. seems to me a very, very special kind of writer because he approaches the novel uh, every time uh, uh, as if it were not a given. You know, some writers, it seems to me, often write novels the way that somebody might make a table. And there's nothing wrong with making tables, but they all have to be level and you have to eat off the surface of them. Uh, and it often seems to me that Russell Hoban approaches the novel as if there are no rules, there are no givens, the legs can all be of a different length. Uh, you know, you don't 
necessarily have to eat off it. You might want to lie down under it. And, uh, <laughs> You know, and that's why I think his books are so astonishing and why he's such an unusual writer. The books are so various, so different, uh, so kind of opalescent and many splendid in that way. Uh, but we were going to focus tonight on Ridley Walker in particular. And, uh, you know, I, I won't get, hopefully get much of an opportunity to speak about it because Russell's going to speak about it. But I've now read the novel, I think, four times. and. I read it for the fourth time over the weekend, and I was absolutely stunned again by it, and emotionally uh, disturbed by it. Perhaps I've become more emotionally labile as I get older, but I found it more disturbing emotionally, I think, than on any of the previous readings. Um, I think you wanted to have some readings, and should I maybe start with one of those, being as an idea? Yes, please do. Shall, shall I? Well, Russell's asked me to, to read a passage uh, so I'm just going to, he said to me just now, you will of course be reading it in the Kentish accents <laughs> some 2,000 years in the future. <laughs> Ridley Walker. Heart of the Wood. There is in the heart of the wood in the Yusa story, that were a stag, everyone knows that. There is in the heart of the wood, meaning the various deep of it, that's another thing. There is the heart of the wood where they burn the charred coal, that's another thing, again, in it. That's another thing, burning the charred coal in the heart of the wood. That's what they call the stack of wood, you see? The stack of wood in the shape they do it for charred coal burning. Why do they call it? The heart, though, that's what this year's story tells of. Everyone knows about bad time and what come after. Bad time first and bad times after. Not many come through it alive. There come a man and a woman and a child. Out of a burning town they sheltered in the woodlings and foraging the best they could. Starveling they were, what they were doing. Didn't have no weapons, nor didn't know now how to make a snare, nor nothing. Snow on the ground and a grey sky overing and the black trees rubbing their branches in the wind. Crows calling one to another, waiting for the three of them to drop. The man, the woman and the child. Digging through the snow, they were eating moss and dead leaves, which they vomited them up again. Freezing cold they were, nor didn't have nothing to make a fire with to get warm. Starveling they were and near come to the end of their strength. The child said, Oh, I'm so cold, I'm afeard I'm going to die, if only we had a little fire to get warm at. The man didn't have no way of making a fire, he didn't have no flint and steel nor nothing. Wood all round them, only there weren't no way he know it of getting warm from it. The three of them ready for auntie, they were ready to total and done. When they're come through the woodlings, a clever looking bloke and singing a little song to hisself. My roading's been so hungry, I've grown so very thin, I've got a little cook pot, but nothing to put in. The man and the woman said to the clever looking bloke, Do you know how to make fire? The clever looking bloke said, Oh, yes, if I know anything, I know that right enough. Fire's my middle name, you might say. The man and the woman said, Would you make a little fire then? We are freezing of the coal. The clever looking bloke said, That for you? And what for me? The man and the woman said, What do we have for waffers? They look at one to the other, and both at the child. The clever looking bloke said, I'll tell you what I'll do. I will share my fire and my crook pot with, if you'll share what to put in the pot. He were looking at the child. The man and the woman thought, two out of three alive is better than three dead. And they said, done. They killed the child and drunk its blood and cut up the meat for cooking. The clever looking bloke said, I'll show you how to make fire, plus, I'll give you flint and steel and makings, nor you don't have to share with me nothing of the meat. 
only the heart, which he made the fire then and gave them the flint and steel and makings. Then he cooked the heart of the child and ate it. The clever looking bloke said, cleverness is gone now, but little by little it will come back. The iron will come back again one day, and when the iron comes back, they will burn charred coal in the heart of the wood. And when they burn the charred coal, their stat will be in the shape of the heart of the child. Off he gone then, singing, seed of the little, seed of the wild, seed of the burning is heart of the child. The man and the woman then eating their child, it were black night all round them. They made their fire bigger and bigger, trying to keep the black from moving in on them. They fell asleep by their fire, and the fire biggering on it, and ate them up, they burnt to death. They bend the old ones, or you might say, the old ones, and become charred coal. That's why they'll tell you the alder tree is best for charring coal. Sometimes you'll hear of an alder kincher, he carries off children. Out goes the candle, out goes the light, out goes my story. And so, good night. Where does it, in, in your afterword to, to the book, Russell, you describe this trip to Canterbury Cathedral and seeing the mural uh, of St Eustace's story and having a kind of epiphanic moment when the book started to come to you. Is that true? It is true. And <clears throat> I've often tried to describe the process, and uh, I'll be repeating myself, as I have in various media. It's a matter of being friends with your head. Uh, and my head has a way of keeping things in a reservoir of ideas, waiting to hook up with whatever they want to hook up with. And so it happened that when I was looking at this 15th century painting of St. Eustace, that my mind jumped to a series of articles by Edmund Wilson of the New Yorker magazine about Punch and Judy puppeteers, the men who make the puppets and perform with them. And these things hooked up in that particular way and I had the beginning of Rivdy Walker, where itinerant puppeteers propagate the policies of such government as there is at his time. I suppose what surprises people, and to some extent even surprises me, is that there's nothing <coughs> programmatic about this. You didn't think to yourself, I mean, we're talking about the early 1970s, a time when uh, the United States and the Soviet Union were in a position of mutually assured destruction. Uh, it had been 10 years or so since the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, but you, you weren't thinking to yourself, I need to write a post-apocalyptic novel to warn people about the follies of nuclear war. There was no element of that in your thinking. The, uh, writing uh, novels with a message I dare to say, although I'm sure there are examples to prove me wrong, is a sure road to disaster. Uh, I think you have to write with what, I think the best writing is done with what enters you and takes possession of you and doesn't let go of you until you get the job done. Mm. Mm. But this vision of the post-apocalyptic world in Ridley Walker feels so highly achieved uh, and did it take an enormous effort to create it? Again, in the notes, in my the edition I was just reading from, you describe how when you started writing it, it was still in a relatively standard English, but quite soon it shifted into Ridley speak. Almost, uh, almost immediately it shifted into Ridley speak, and uh, I went with it. I, I trusted my gut feeling about it, and I kept lists of the new words that I was putting into it, and uh, occasionally I would have to go back and bring the new words uh, into where they belong. And uh, the, uh, the thing about uh, Ridley's speak is that 
I, I didn't uh, calculate it as such, but what it does technically is make the reader slow down through Ridley's rate of perception. So technically it's a good device. But it, I agree, but also it seems to me to rub away at the present and create a, a sense of deep time in and of itself. So while this is a language of the distant future, it also seems to be a language of the distant past at the same time. I think it does. Some people have compared it to Middle English. Mm. Mm. So uh, again, uh, I have to charge that to inspiration, which is uh, a tired out and overused and now almost meaningless word. But I think that it came to me to do the thing as I did it. And uh, I recall, I can't quote it verbatim, but Ralph Waldo Emerson said something about a channel of public energy that a man can tune into. And when I was working on Ripley Walker, uh, any particular idea channel I found was fed by tributaries of ideas that I didn't know the existence of. They just fed into it. It was a fairly, I mean, I'm not making this as a critical remark, it was a fairly long process writing. It took you about four years to write the book. It took me five and a half years. And uh, in the first two years, <coughs> excuse me, I have to put some water. In the first two years, I had 500 pages, but they weren't it. They weren't concentrated enough, and they were spread over too much uh, geography, and so I started again, and this time I boiled it down to uh, 200 and something pages, and that's where I went with. But to what extent, I mean, you had come to live in England in the late 1960s, that trip to, to Canterbury, the, the exposure to the, to the murals in the early 1970s, to what extent do you think coming to live here was implicated in the inspiration of the novel? I mean, it's a, in a way a ludicrous counterfactual, but could you imagine having written it in the United States? No. Uh, I'm trying to track back to the beginnings of it. Uh, well, first of all, I came to this country because of an obsession with British ghost stories, with M.R. James, Shirley Le Penu, Algernon Blackwood, uh, Arthur Macken, and uh, I wanted to spend some time living in a London that had figured in those stories. And being here, uh, I opened myself to the ethos of English storytelling. I don't know, I've never said this before. I, I don't know if it rings true or not, but anyhow, that's what I'm saying now. <laughs> and uh, when the time came for Ridley Walker, it was after I finished Turtle Diary in 1974, and one of the things that uh, helped to get me started on Ripley Walker was a story by Gerald Kirsch called Voices in the Dust of Annan, in which an explorer in the future falls through the ruins of what used to be London and finds himself living in some very small people who dress in rat skins and hunt rats and live on them. And they sing corrupted versions of songs like Balasamo, Balasamo, uh, and Upu uh, Karabin. <laughs> and that intrigued me. And I felt like fooling around with language that way. So that was one of the elements that came into it. And I don't remember whether there was anything else that was a starter uh, that made me go from Careful diary to Ridley Walker, except the, uh, well, my, when I visited Canterbury Cathedral, uh, well, I stood in that 
nave and looked up at this numinous uh, fan bolting and I could feel the uprush of all these centuries of hopes and fears and aspiration and hopes for salvation. And, uh, well, you, uh, something like that takes hold of you. And then uh, I walked up those steps past the place where Beckett was murdered, uh, you know, with the, the remembered blood still seeps on those stones, and got to the North Isle and found this painting of uh, St. Eustace. It was uh, the, on this side of the wall was the original painting faded almost to nothing but an earth green faint tracery. On this side was Professor Tristram's reconstruction uh, with the story. And from top to, from bottom to top, uh, we saw how Eustace, uh, who was uh, a, a commander of horse in the Roman army, uh, saw Christ crucified in the antlers of the stag, and he immediately was converted and uh, set off on a pilgrimage. Uh, his wife was taken off by pirates. He was crossing a river with his two little sons, got one son to the farther bank, came back to the other. Uh, when a wolf carried off the one son and a lion the other, and here's Eustace uh, in the middle of the river, treading water and hoping for better times. <laughs> and my life at that time was such that I identified with Eustace. And uh, went on from there. Eustace, of course, came to a, he's an apocryphal saint, so he lends himself well to fiction. And he, uh, he and his wife and children ended up being roasted alive in a brazen bull. So uh, it wasn't a good trip for him altogether. <laughs> but it got me started on quite an interesting trip. One of the very powerful, many powerful and affecting aspects of the novel for me is the way that Ridley and, and the people of his period conflate their sort of scumbled, half-forgotten, orally transmitted memories of Christianity with the cultural memory of science and the power of science. Uh, and, and this is very moving, so the use the user story conflates elements of atomic fission with Christianity. And again, was this, I, I, I realize I'm, I'm, I'm well prepared to be knocked back on this, but was there an, an intellectual element to you devising this syncretism, or, or was it again a question of inspiration that it just occurred to you that that's what it would be like? Uh. I plead innocent to the charge of intellectuality. <laughs> you have many support. <laughs> I, I fly completely by the seat of my pants. And uh, I, I write with what comes to me. And when, uh, when Yusa confronts the little shining man, the Adam, and pulls him apart like he was a chicken. Uh, that's just the way the story came to me. There are some elements in Ridley's world, though, that, that again, ring completely authentic and seem very much what one would expect. But again, I wondered how they occurred to you. For start, Ridley's 12. It's been his, the book starts with his naming day. He's 12 years old. And it's a, it's a culture in which a 12-year-old boy is a man. Uh, and so one assumes that lifespans are relatively short. He's already sexually active uh, at this age. The other thing, and I don't know whether he's remarked on this before, is he, he moves incredibly fast when he's roading uh, around post-apocalyptic Kent. He seems to cover anything up to 40 or 50, sometimes 50 miles a night. Well, Charles Dickens was a hell of a walker, you know? He, he would do 25 mile walks and come home and write 50 letters. So, uh, you no, know, Ridley's walking uh, is consonant with his culture.
Mm. So it's it's an expression of the kind of energy and the, the vitality. Oh the yeah, the uh, good party says to him, uh, really you're a mover. I wouldn't have to do nothing but make you keep moving. You'd get everything done. I wondered, and uh, I, I mean I I don't know much about you biographically apart from what's in the public domain. Uh, but, you know, you served with, with the U.S. Army during the Second War. Uh, you must have seen some things, as they say. I wonder how much that informed your post-apocalyptic vision of a society where life is extremely cheap. I don't know. I, uh, I never fired a shot in anger, but I was shot at, and I saw a lot of dead bodies turning various colors and bloating. And... Uh, Certainly that goes into the consciousness, the uh, having been acquainted with the death at first hand. Mm. Because you write about it, or, or Ridley, through Ridley, you write about it in a way that in some ways seems to have no effect at all, but in other ways is of course highly, highly emotionally coloured. And that's, it struck me that, that Ridley's world is a kind of a war zone. Yes, it is. It's definitely, uh, it's full of danger from all sides uh, and with danger threatening from abroad too in the form of what they call uh, foreign secret triers, bringing uh, the uh, makings for the, the one little one. Mm. Was it the, I mean, again, it seemed to me the, you know, again, the logical way in creating Ridley's world would, would have been for it to be an oral culture, and it does have many elements of what you expect an oral culture to be like, a, a concentration on, you know, memberment, uh, and, on, and on what people can hold in their minds. And yet, Ridley is literate. Was that just necessary in order for, for the book itself to exist? Sorry, I... I... Well, I mean, Ridley can write, yes. and, and it is a literate culture. Yes. That confused me in a way, Am I, and yet in another way it seems in keeping with the kind of otherness of this world, that it should be a literate culture. Well, uh, I'm trying to remember whether I wrote that uh, all connection men can read and write. Mm. I think they, they could. And uh, the, uh, certainly the, the people who govern the country at the RAM uh, are literate. Uh, well, you know, the book couldn't have existed without Ridley's being literate. No, no, I know. I mean, if you would have had to find some other framing mechanism in order to convey his narrative. But again, I'm, I'm not saying, ooh, I don't... On the contrary, I think it's, it's, it, it's one of the marvellous things about the book, that it, it is a world entire that is kind of believable in that way and, and uh, isn't exactly constant. It's not just like a Iron Age culture. No. Uh, in that way. I mean, were you, did you look at things like you know, like uh, ancient history and prehistory and anything like that before you began writing? I, I started, uh, my first attempt was written in standard English and it had written me as a kind of a uh, uh, anthropologist, a kind of anthropologist uh, who was interested in his culture, and I remember uh, looking up some words. There was one, I think, Thanites, and uh, I, pres I went down that road very briefly and then tossed it out of the window, and uh, I did what I did in Kleinsight, where instead mm. of reading medical dictionaries, I made up my own names for things, mm. so that he was... Uh, the hypotenuse. Yes, yeah, so the hypotenuse and his asymptotes were in trouble. Um, so I, that, that's when I... In Klein's eye, though, that invented medical lexicon, which I remember very well, is simultaneously funny and very disturbing at the same time. And it's the most unsettling beginning to a book. <laughs> But there's a different kind of tension or a different kind of access in, in Ridley's speech, isn't there? I mean, when I was introducing it, I was saying how intensely emotional it made me feel as a book. Very sad, very lonely, uh, 
very intense about people in that way. Was, was that your experience in writing it? Was it? Yes. Uh, his uh, it his uh, language is emotional, and I felt it when I was writing. Uh, there was a point when uh, Ridley and I both wept uh, when I was writing the book, and that's when, after uh, Good Polly and Grancer have blown themselves up, uh, this black dog, uh, the black leader of the Bergdorf's pack, who is his constant companion, this dog who looks like death on four legs and has yellow eyes, he shoves his nose into Ridley's hand and wants to be petted. And Ridley says, that's when I cried for the dead. And that's when I cried when I read it. So that I, I did live that book as I wrote it. There's a sense, isn't there, that, that, that all of Ridley's feeling is, is sort of post-traumatic in the way that he cannot af allow himself to respond to his father's death at the beginning of the book. And then his allegiance shifts from one man to another. And, it, and to begin with, you think, hang on a minute, you can't now suddenly be liking Good Parley or want to, you know, you've gone for the listener, then you go for Good Parley, then Belmont Fist, and so on. And yet, isn't that about him trying to deal with the loss of his father in some way? The loss of Bruder Walker in Witter's Stump has a profound effect on Ridley, and he is, you know, they've said goodbye to Bruder on the Bye Bye Hump, and they've sung past the Sarver and Galaxies and Flaming Nebulae. He's seething inside, and he is just about ready to go when, uh, in the digging at Witter's Dump, he reaches down into the muck and comes up with this blackened figure of Punch, and Bill up this says, here, give me that, and Ridley pulls him into the uh, muck and leaves him with his legs sticking up and goes over the fence. And you could read. And shall I read that, that section? Yes, shall I do it also in my immaculate? Uh, <laughs> shall I do it in my immaculate future Kentish accent? Absolutely immaculate. <laughs> I put my hand in the muck and I reach it down and come up with something it were a show figure, like the ones in the USA show, wooden head and hands and the rest of it cloth. All of it gone black and showman's hands still in it, cut off, just a little way up the wrist. A grown up hand and a regular showman he'd been because when I wipe it off you could see the callus round the head finger, same as all the USA showmen have. This here figure, though, it weren't like no other figure I ever seen. It were crooked, had a hump on its back and part of salt there in the cloth. For a while, I couldn't think what it might be. Then when it come to me what it were, I couldn't hardly believe it. Yet there it were, nor no mistaking it, it were a hump. And it were meant to be a hump. The head weren't like no other head. I ever seen in a show, neither. The face had a big nose, what hook it down, and a big chin, what hook it up, and a smiling mouth. Some kind of little pointy hat on the head, it curve it over with a wagger on the end of it. I'd been so interested in the figure and the dead hand, I hadn't been taking no notice of no one round me. I look it up, and there were that little whitey bloke, Bell Knot Fist, standing by the hole, and his little pinky eye on me, I felt like making the bad luck go away sign. Fisk says, what's that you've got there? I didn't say nothing. We weren't allowed it to keep nothing we found in the digging. Sometimes they used to search us, though not always. He says, you best answer me. I said, what's that you've got there? I said, why don't you have a look for yourself? He says, all right, I will then, give it here. He come to the edge of the hole and stuck out his hand. I put the figure and the dead hand in my pocket. Then quick, I grab it, fist's hand in both of mine and whirl it round fast and slung him over my shoulder head, head first into the muck. 
I couldn't do nothing else to save my life. Out of the corner of my eye, I seen his feet sticking up out of the muck and kicking, and chalk a marchman, the first man of the digging, coming after me. I up it out of the hole with my feet sucking and squelching, and up the mounded dirt to the high walk, and over the fence, before I know it what I were doing. It were my feet done it by theirselves. I never give it no thought at all. Come down with a thump on the outside of the fence, and sliding down the slippy bank into the ditch, which I come up out of the soak it and sopping, and there were that black leader, waiting for me with his yellow eyes, just standing there in the rain and waiting for me. I believe you have something in your little bag to show us. <laughs> I do indeed. I have brought Mr. Punch. That's his. That's his stick. Slapstick. <laughs> <laughs> and here is the man himself. He's made by Bob Wade, who uh, has much bigger hands and thicker wrists than I do. Jack Ketch. He kills, uh, I think, several uh, members of the police and, and uh, other authorities. And he even kills the devil. And he says, uh, now everyone can do as they like. Now, uh, the great Percy Press, the, who was the premier uh, punch showman, uh, said to me, punch is so old he can't die. He's a law unto himself. And thinking about Punch, uh, he doesn't seem to, there's something in him that doesn't care about him, that he is simply the vehicle for it. And I was remembering uh, a, a broken seagull. Uh, do you want to read that, that bit? Uh, we never found that bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, in my copy you'll find it. Should we read it? You want me to read it now? Um, I'm happy. Yeah, it's, uh, I'd like to have Ridley's words exactly. If I can find the damn thing. Shall I have a look? I think I've got it. And I believe it's listed as either a skull sign. Mm -hmm. 88. Can't quite find the reference. Did I mark the beginning? It's a skull sign. No, you haven't. It's when Ridley's um, uh, The Rain Heavy On by the End of the Day were coming down in buckets, plus it blowed up a heavy wind. No, uh, uh, there's, he says, uh, one time with my. He's dad, with the listener. Is with the listener. Um, full circle nine ways. Horny boy rung with his bell. No. No. No, the hell with it then. It is a great bit as we get on to the bloke has got on top of Auntie. <laughs> <laughs> One of my favourites. That sort of links in with Punch. I mean, and with with kind of. I mean, there are a lot of these kind of powerful <laughs> mythological figures in Ridley's book. Can you tell us what you wanted? Uh, uh, he, he was remembering uh, walking with his dad along the shore one time when they saw a broken of gull, and his father killed it. But the, gull was, the gull's yellow eyes stared scareless to the last, and it was as if 
It was something in the creator that didn't care nothing for the creator That's it, yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah. It, it was just uh, something in it. And uh, that something is in punch. Uh, but that's also echoed in the story that Lorna, is it Lorna, tells him early on where he says this, she's discovered there's something looking out through yes. our eyes. So there's a, they have a consciousness of this elemental force, don't they, that's refracted back to them through the punch story. Yes, and uh, this thing that lives in all of us but doesn't care for us, it uses us, it puts us on to act out what we will, but it doesn't really care. And we, we are the people whom Ridley looks back to as the ones who made the one big one. From, from more than 2,000 years ahead, he looks back to us as the people who made the one big one. And this thing in us didn't care nothing for us. It didn't care nothing for anybody. It's just there. And uh, there's a tension, isn't there, in his perception of the people of the past? Because at one, he both thinks that they're kind of before the fall. They're prelapsarian figures who are who are kind of integrated psychically, and he feels the weight of dualism, doesn't he? He's always worried about the two being made into one. He feels his own reflective self-consciousness as a burden, and yet in the mythology and the kind of the punch story that comes round. Uh, the clever, Mr. Clever, is responsible for the destruction of all that's good. So it's almost as if enshrined in the, in the people from the past is their own destruction at the yes. same time. I've never had the opportunity to use the word prelapsarian. <laughs> <laughs> I, I myself feel like a bit postlapsarian. <laughs> But it eases up later in the day. <laughs> I never feel the day is done. Let the day begin. <laughs> Anyhow, my answer to your inquiry was yes. <laughs> When did you acquire your punch, your Mr. Punch? Well, uh, in the course of uh, writing Ridley Walker, I joined the uh, British Puppet and Model Theatre Guild. And it was there uh, that I uh, met Bob Wade and bought these, uh, bought the whole set of punch figures, you know, with the crocodile and Jack Ketch and so forth. Did you have a set up? I didn't a fit up, no. A fit up, right, I didn't yeah. have a fit up, but I did have uh, Percy Press come to my house uh, one day and give a complete performance. And, you know, to me it was wonderful because it hadn't been part of my childhood. And you immediately battened on to it, and from the things he said about Punch, you know, kind of being too old to die, yeah. you immediately battened on to this as being something absolutely enduring in folk art that, oh, that, that couldn't be. There's, there's a punch in every country. In, in Germany, it's Casparle. In Italy, it's uh, Punchinella or Policinella. In France, it's uh, Policinella. Uh, and it goes, the punch goes all the way back to the Commedia dell'arte and back beyond that to the Greeks who had these uh, humpback figures with uh, big phalluses uh, that uh, did funny things. <laughs> Do you think there's something very important about it being a puppet, about it being something separate and yet humanoid in that way? Well, the art of puppetry is uh, a, a long established mode of surrogacy where you can, puppets can do things that real people couldn't get away with and they'll always get a laugh, and they'll always get a gut response from the audience. Mm. Mm. One of the things I wanted, since I have the opportunity, I wanted to ask you about was listener 
and the use of folk themselves. And how early, and the kind of setup of the power ring around Canterbury, how, I know what I think all of that is, but do you know what you think it all is? <laughs> well, my idea for the power ring came from the CERN uh, accelerator in uh, Switzerland. Uh, now my idea for listener, uh, again, I don't know why I made this Archbishop of Cambrai uh, without eyes. Uh, again, I was just flying by the seat of my pants. I suppose uh, if we try to <laughs> exegesize it, uh, there will be some sort of a message in there about uh, religion being blind, I don't know, but I wasn't thinking of that. It just came to me that this kid didn't have any eyes, and because, uh, because he didn't have any eyes, he had to listen very hard, and that's where the other voice out of the world comes in. It's a long shot, which you'll feel free to slap down, but you were a radio operator in the war, weren't you? I was trained as a radio operator, but uh, that uh, availed me nothing. I was a foot messenger, and I had uh, such a bad sense of direction. I used to tear up bits of K-ration. I used to tear up K-ration boxes to mark my trail like the hands <laughs> <laughs> One time, I passed and repassed the same hill so many times, the Germans thought I was a troop movement. <laughs> <laughs> but the use of folk themselves are, are a, as I understand it, a group of radioactively, genetically damaged mutants that have been preserved within the society for their kind of divinatory powers. Well, they, they use a symposium, all wriggling together like a nest of snakes. And it's hoped that they will come up with the necessary secrets for uh, the one big one. Mm. And uh, they never do. You know, they, they might talk advanced theory and uh, all of that, but uh, it's just gibberish. And uh, they don't uh, come up with the one little one until somebody gives them a, a pot of sulfur and the other ingredients. But they're all affected more or less the same way, the listener, good parley, they, they're all groping around the same set of ideas and I find it very disturbing the way that Ridley shifts from one to the other. I mean Ridley is in a sense smarter than all of them, isn't he? He's in a sense... Smarter than all of them. He yes. grasps more of it than any of the rest of them. And they respond to him, eventually you, you see that they, they understand that he understands more than they do. He, he responds to good parley uh, the most emotionally of all. Yes, uh, because Good Parley opens himself to him more than he has to anyone mm. and uh, tells him about his boyhood and the way Gramsci treated him. And, uh, and then, he, then Good Parley does a punch show for him, which uh, is what Ridley uh, takes with him when he takes to the road as a showman. But uh, Good Parley is trying in his own in his own impeded way to move inland forward. Mm. Uh, he's doing the best he can, but he's not doing it very well. When you finished Ridley Walk, it must have been a very emotional moment to actually finish the book and put it to one side. And in your <laughs> foreword to Pilger Man, which is the next book you wrote, you then go and do it again. You go to Galilee and have another major epiphany uh, and move off again on, a, on, a, on another strange journey. And how, how did that feel, Russell? <laughs> how does it feel to... How did it feel then to move from Ridley World to Pilgerman World, which is by no means that jolly, I mean... No, that was in my high energy period. <laughs> and, uh, no, I, I, uh, Pilgerman uh, had his inception 
in a trip to Israel that I made with my uh, daughter Esme and her husband Moti. And uh, we went to a, uh, oh, now the name of the fort escapes me, it might come back later. Anyhow, we went to a, a fort which had been used by the Teutonic Knights of the 13th century. Uh, and that is where Togermann precipitated himself into the beginning of the story. These, these uh, Teutonic Knights were big Jew killers, and Pilgrimon, of course, was a Jew who was castrated by peasant crusaders in the 12th century. And I immediately uh, bought about five yards of books and uh, steeped myself in the research and read all of the contemporary accounts and uh, got started on, on Pilgrimon. And uh, I still like that book a lot. Uh, call me Pilgrimon, you know. Uh, I, for, I forget how it's, what, what I am. Uh, is, uh, a wave, I know, it's to say a wave mm -hmm. and a particle, it's not even a... a Something about uh, a sword and the sword is rusted and the mm. rust is blown away and uh, one time as a boy in the ruins of a building, I saw uh, an owl, what we call a veiled owl, flying towards me. And I said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Anyhow, uh, I, uh, I had a good time writing Pilgrimon, and uh, I did a good pope, Uncle uh, the Seventh or something, <laughs> who, uh, who had some pretty good dreams. <laughs> you say um, that was during my high energy period, but you've been remarkably prolific over the last decade or so. Well, yes, I do what I can. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, and your work continuing to move into different areas, and very erotic, some of the novels of the last decade? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, life is, isn't it? Absolutely. And uh, my, uh, my next big one is called Soon Child, which is about uh, an Eskimo shaman uh, whose daughter doesn't want to be born because she refuses to come out into the world until he brings her the world songs. So he uh, brews up a big dream brew, and he goes on a dream trip, which takes him hither, thither, and yon, and through many, many changes. Uh, so I, I, uh, I have to hang in there until 2012, because it won't be published till then. Well, I think rather you hang it a lot longer than that, <laughs> than the same with you. Um, <laughs> I think we, we, we've got a little while yet, and if, uh, Russell said he's happy to, to take some questions, so if anybody would, would like to ask him anything, uh, then please put your hand up and then wait for the microphone to come to you, please. There's a gentleman down here at the front. Forgive my memory, it's not... Forgive my memory, it's not what it was, but it, it, was it the case when you were writing Ridley Walker that you were in analysis and you would take it along and read out chapters. Was, it, was that the case and if so, why? Could you repeat that for me? Um, he's, he's asking, he's saying he, he, he thinks he's heard or read somewhere that you were in psychoanalysis when you were writing Ridley Walker and that you would take the novel in MS along to your analytic sessions and read out sections. If it's true, it rather begs the question why your analysts didn't pay you. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true? It, it wasn't psychoanalysis, it was psychotherapy. And I used to have sessions with Leon Ritter, and I used to read him uh, what I was writing. Uh, trying to think of my reason. Uh, 
Maybe I just wanted a private audience. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I, I think I wanted to uh, test the validity of it, of it on him. You know, did, did the characters ring true? Would he, can you remember what he said about the book when you were reading sections of it too? No, I can't. Mm. You definitely need your money back. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? There's a woman down here at the front. Um, I just would like to know if when you were, um, you talk about Ready Speak being very organic, it came about organically, if you found yourself um, having to tone it down a little bit to make, try and make the story more accessible so that it was more widely appreciated uh, by a, a big audience? That's a long question. <laughs> the, the, the nub of it is, Ridley speak, did you make it more accessible than it might otherwise have been? Were you conscious of how people would read the book as you were writing it? And, and were you, <coughs> you know, calibrating just how difficult it was as against standard English? No. Uh, Again, I just wrote it as it came to me. I didn't, uh, as I've said before, I realized later that it was a technically good device for slowing the reader down to Ridley's rate of perception, but uh, I didn't do any calculation or calibration. I just done it how it come. Mm. Mm. I mean, there are, you now have, I mean, in this Bloomsbury edition, there is your notes and there's an afterword and there's a sort of mini glossary at the back, you know, where you've put in a few things. Yes. I confess, I did find them very helpful. You did. I did find them very helpful. You did. And I, but again, you know, what I find strange, I don't know whether this accords with anybody else's experience who's read the book several times, it is different each time. Uh, it seems very, a very different book to me each time. I read it, it seems to have a different modality as a book, and that, I can't help feeling, is a function of the way, what you do with English, uh, which is to make us very aware of the fact that English is a language in which there are at least two words for everything, and many, many words are homonyms themselves, so they, you know, and, uh, and I, I suppose that's why, anyway, I'm wrapping on there, that's not I, I was very pleased with some of my Inventions, for example, when uh, Orving uh, leaves the uh, the use of folk, uh, he says, "I had to vote no kind of fence," so I backed my way out of there. Well, vote no kind of fence is a breakdown of no confidence, a vote mm. of no confidence. I had to vote no kind of fence, <laughs> and then uh, he backed his way. He evacuated. Well, I, I think Ed Miliband uh, <laughs> is the current Shadow Mensa. <laughs> would be well advised to read Ridley Walker. <laughs> There's a, a, a woman here, halfway back. Do you have any academic experience of historical linguistics or pidgins or creoles that informed how you constructed Ridley Speak? Any academic experience of linguistics, of pidgin languages, <laughs> anything like that? No. I, I knew you was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think that I think there are things that uh, spring naturally to the tongue. And I believe there is a, uh, a linguistic uh, term for uh, this kind of migration, where great becomes girt, uh, and such, such things as that. Uh, it's just, uh, when you move your mouth, it's a, great, it's a great day for shining your shoes. It's a great, it's a girt day. It's a girt day for shining your shoes. It's a girt day for losing the blues. It mm. uh, happens naturally. And uh, I was going to say something else about the language. Oh, yeah. Uh, in Pennsylvania, where I grew up, the auxiliary verb very often was thrown over the side. So people would say, I've done this, or I've gone there. 
So that's already a start on Ridley Speak. We do that here too. <laughs> uh, what is it? Can you sound like you might know about linguistics? It's worth, is it called glottal drift or something like that? When you, the, the, I, I can't remember. What you studied it once though, didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> that was certainly worth our tax dollars. <laughs> I speak to myself. <laughs> it came out harsher than it should have. Uh, anybody with a speak up there? Somebody? There's a man up the back there, bearded man. Oh, right, sorry. Oh, you've got a beard too, haven't you? It's not as big as me. Yeah. <laughs> I really enjoyed the geography of the book, and particularly the map, which I've referred back to several times. I'm just wondering how much time you spent in Kent during the writing of the book. He loves the, the maps and the geography of Kent, or inland in it, and wonders how much time you actually spent in Kent uh, during the composition of the book. A lot of time in Kent. Uh, at that time, I had a Bedford camper, and... Uh, with my wife Gundel, and uh, at that time uh, we had just two sons, and uh, we drove around Kent into the uh, Y Valley and uphill and downdale, and uh, stayed overnight. And also, uh, at one time, to test whether. There really were times when you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. I rode Pillion on the motorbike of a friend, and we went into Kent and into a forest uh, in the dead of night, and I couldn't see my hands in front of my face. So, uh, yes, it was uh, well researched uh, on the actual ground. And then the, the gentleman down here. I just want to uh, start the language. Um, what I loved about Ridley Speak, it's one of the joys of the book for me. I have to read it out loud to understand it, it's rather than reading internally. It's uh, made me read out, uh, read out loud again to myself to, uh, to understand it. I just wondered um, how much of reading out aloud was involved in the, uh, or saying those words out loud was involved in the creation of it. All of my writing, uh, not just Ridley Walker, all of my books are written uh, for the ear, so that they will bear up under reading aloud. And uh, I, you know, I, I sound them out in my head, and I go over every line until it works. Where does that come from, Russell? Were you read to a lot as a child? Hmm, just trying to remember. Uh, I was read to a bit as a child, certainly enough to uh, instill the habit in me. And uh, I was given plenty of books as a child, and I still remember <laughs> uh, my father uh, was a socialist, but uh, I guess he would have to be called a communist sympathizer at the time. And he used to. Uh, bring me books. Uh, I remember particularly one called Fairy Tales for Workers' Children. <laughs> and, uh, what a collection of hard luck stories. <laughs> there was uh, a little black guy called Little Black Burzuk, and uh, he had a terrible time. And there was a yellow dog that also had a bad time. Uh, Smart on me, I can tell you. <laughs> so, the, the, presumably, if your father was a was a fellow traveller, you were not an observant family. No, and uh, apropos of his fellow travelling, the uh, the first two rules of etiquette that I learned were always to eat the label on the pumpernickel for good luck, and never to cross a picket line. <laughs> <laughs> He himself, we lived in Landsville, Pennsylvania, and he 
uh, was put in jail. Uh, there was a hosiery mill there, that was the local industry, and the workers went on strike from time to time, and he was put in jail for uh, marching in a picket line with the workers. And uh, in the front room in our house, there was a, a tin cannikin uh, in which he had had water when he was in jail. Uh, also, that was on top of the grandfather clock, on which was also a bust of Eugene Debs. <laughs> and uh, as a boy, I was taken to uh, hear Norman Thomas, who frequently ran for president but never made the distance. And uh, I shook his hand too. And uh, my father steadfastly voted socialist. He wouldn't have anybody to vote for here. Right <laughs> 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 anybody else? Yes, there's a uh, woman in a hat just there. In a hat. In a hat. Well, I mean, I don't, it's just a very easy way of identifying. I don't know your secret hopes and desires. <laughs> and you're not going to, Bill. <laughs> I mean, she, she objected to my typifying her as a woman in her hand. <laughs> what did I do? You didn't start off by saying, here's Russell Herbert in a hat. <laughs> anyway, let's stop arguing and I'll come up with my, my question. What is your question for the man in the hand? <laughs> Russell. Yes. In 1970, you gave a writing workshop at a conference on children's literature in education in Exeter. Yes. In that writing workshop, which I was not lucky enough to be born to be at. What was that? You... She wasn't born. <laughs> <laughs> or else she would have been there. I would. I would. <laughs> All right. Make you... the effort now. Yes. <laughs> Never too late. You described, you said the most important thing in writing was describing the thingness of things. Do you still believe that? Was describing? <laughs> thingness of things. <laughs> what, what, what guys with $10 words call quiddity, I believe. Describing the thingness of things. Yeah, well, uh, there's a, a, a word for it. that the thing itself in itselfness. But I, it, ding so, on zish. Ding on zish. Yes. No matter we're into Kantian metaphysics now, I knew we'd get there eventually. <laughs> <laughs> I knew you'd get on to Kant and metaphysics. You're hiding your intellectualism there, Kantley. I, I have never read Kant. <laughs> <laughs> The thing about me is, I'm given credit for uh, much learning that I don't have because I'm good at picking quotations. From the, I, I can take uh, a, big, a book this thick and riffle through it and come up with a quotation that will convince people I've read the whole thing. It's artful. <laughs> But do you mean by that to say that, that Russell's approach about the thingness of things is perhaps distinct from many people view the novel as a medium particularly for discussing character or the development of character or the relationships between people or the relationship between individual psychic change and social change. Uh, but I think what the woman who we must not call the woman in the hand <laughs> is, is driving at is that your take on the novel is different to that. Well, the, the writer whom I credit with expressing the thickness of things more than anybody else is Anton Chekhov, who is my current main squeeze. <laughs> and uh, he just does it. He, uh, he can talk about uh, the moonlight on the ocean. He can talk about the, uh, the smell of the trees and flowers in a garden. Uh, that transcends 
mere description of what, what they look like, what they smell like, and the sounds they make when the wind blows through them. He gets right to the thingness of things. Uh, I don't know whether it can be learned. Uh, either you got it or you have it. If you got it, flaunt it. <laughs> I think time maybe for, for one more. There's somebody right behind you, John, there, and then somebody up the top who's been. Yes. Uh, the, the, the story in Ridley Walker I find profoundly depressing and disturbing. It's a frightening tale in its own right. Um, at the same time, it's full of levity and humour, a lot of which comes, I think, from the language uh, and the distinctive voice of the narrator, Ridley himself. But in the end, it's, uh, it's very ambiguous. And I'd like to know, Russell, whether you, when you think about the book, find it optimistic or pessimistic. How would you classify it in terms of a, a, a story? The burden of that was that the end is ambiguous. And would I say that it's pessimistic or optimistic? You've got it in a nutshell, but the front end of it was largely a statement. <laughs> A good statement. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's it's left that way. Uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Ridley Walker's been to show. Ridley Walker's on the go. Don't go Ridley Walker's track. Drop, drop John's writing on his back. So he's he's off on his unending journey, uh, looking for he doesn't know what, and showing what comes to him when he puts his head in the head hole of the puppet and <coughs> does his show. It's, uh, it's left open-ended. We don't know what his future is any more than we know our own. And then I think there's a lot of final one up here with the yes, um, beard and the glasses, the shirt, polo, <laughs> <laughs> uh, trousers, and under them. Hi, Will. Hi. Uh, <laughs> uh, my question is, it seems that when you were looking at the picture of St. Eustace at uh, Canterbury uh, Cathedral, it was a life-changing moment. Um, but I was wondering at the time, how long you were looking at it for, and what you were feeling physically, what was sort of going on? Looking at the when you were looking at the picture of St Eustace, he, he wants a more visceral description of your epiphany. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, the viscera of my epiphany are internal. Well, how about the thingness of your epiphany? <laughs> the thingness of my epiphany. Uh, I don't rightly know that I can say more about it. Uh, it just, uh, it just got to me. I think that uh, you don't have to be a writer to have that experience when an event or something you see or some person suddenly gets to you. And there it is, you have to do something about it. Can't say more than that. Well, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, I think the modern uh, mania for uh, getting writers up on stages and making us trot around like performing dogs, <laughs> like, the, like the dogs in Ridley Walker, <laughs> when he has the vision at Cambry and they rise up on their hind legs and dance around him. I'm getting slightly carried away now. Uh, <laughs> often is not such a good thing, but I think that, I, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the last uh, hour and a quarter has been an exceptional and rare privilege to hear Russell talk about it.
retreats don't stop there because <laughs> I, I believe that Russell will be here for a while. I know some of you might not have an opportunity to put a question and might want to whisper one in his <coughs> shell like He'll be here to sign books. It just gets better and better. <laughs>